Located in Fenchurch Place, we find Fenchurch Street Station. The impressive facade was designed by George Barclay in 1854 and is surrounded by the numerous office blocks in the vicinity, being a part of London's financial district. Of all London's mainline termini, Fenchurch Street is by far the smallest, with a total of four platforms. In fact, the station is the only one in London not to be served directly by the London Underground, the closest being the Circle and District Line station at Tower Hill. In addition, Fenchurch Street, along with Marlebone, are the only two not to be managed by Network Rail. In this case, management comes from the main train operating company, C2C. The franchise is currently under the control of Tren Italia, a subsidiary of Ferrovive dello Stato Italiani. In Bay Platform 1 is a couple of four-car Class 357 Electrostar multiple units, ready to form an eight-car service on one of the half-hourly services to Shubury Ness. Our journey over the former London, Tilbury and Southend Railway will be split into two parts. Part 1 will take us over the LTSR's direct line between Barking and Pitsy, before rejoining the original formation and continuing on to Southend and Shubury Ness. Leaving Fenchurch Street, we can see the terminus of the Docklands Light Railway at Tower Gateway, located on the former London and Blackpool Railway's terminus at Minories. It had opened to Poplar in 1840, and initially the two independent tracks were worked by cable haulage. This ceased in 1848 with the introduction of steam. The objective of the line was to improve communication between the docks and the city. Minories was only a temporary terminus as within a year on the 20th of July 1841 all operations began operating out of Fenchurch Street. This is the only part of the original LMB that survives today. Passenger services beyond Stepney, now Limehouse, were withdrawn in 1926 but freight continued until the decline of London stocks in 1968. Past Shadwell DLR station. The original L&B station was opened here in 1840 but closed in 1941. In 1900 the station had been known as Shadwell and St George's East, possibly to distinguish it from the East London Railway Station of the same name.
sharp radius curve of 20 miles an hour takes us into Limehouse Station. The station opened firstly on the original formation of the LMB to Poplar in 1840 with the name Stepney. These platforms opened in 1850 and by 1923 the station became Stepney East and following the opening of the DLR in 1987 the name was finally changed to Limehouse. The DLR continues on the original formation of the LMB. The DLR has greatly expanded since opening in 1987 from Tower Gateway to Canary Wharf and now has seven branch lines, 45 stations and carries 116.8 million passengers every year. excellent view of the skyline of Canary Wharf, the symbol of the Docklands regeneration. Number one Canada Place being an iconic London landmark located on the Isle of Dogs is now the third tallest skyscraper in the UK after the Shard and 22 Bishop's Gate. This short stretch of line from Limehouse to Gas Factory Junction and beyond was opened nine years after the original LMB line in 1849. To our right is the Gas Factory Loop, also the site of Burdett Road Station from 1871 to 1941. At Gas Factory Junction, a single line spur diverges towards the Great Eastern Main Line at Pudding Mill Lane. This line can be used by trains on diversion, avoiding West Ham altogether and running via Stratford, only to rejoin its correct formation on the approach to Barking. From Gas Factory Junction to as far as Barking, a joint venture opened this line in 1858 by the Eastern Counties and London and Blackwall Railways. We approach the one-time Campbell Road Junction, where the Whitechapel and Bow Railway converges, Nowadays it's part of the district and Hammersmith and City lines. The former shadows the C2C lines all the way to Upminster. This is Bromley by Bow. Once the original station was sited closer to the River Lee, but moved to the current location in 1894. Worth mentioning is that the station proclaimed the title of just Bromley. Renaming took place in 1967. Here the line crosses the River Lee and Bow Creek, close to the 18th century tidal mill known today as the House Mill. Lines noticeably climb on the approach to West Ham at a gradient of 1 in 100 to cross the Jubilee and Docklands light railway tracks.
West Ham is the most recent addition to the former London, Tilbury and Southend Railway, opening in 1999 to facilitate interchange with the Jubilee Line extension from Charing Cross to Stratford. There had been an earlier station on this site, which opened in 1901, though it was demolished in 1962 as part of the LTSR's electrification project. As well as interchange with the three underground lines, West Ham also provides the connections to the Stratford International branch of the Docklands Light Railway, whose line opened in 2011 on the former North London Line branch to North Woolwich, which had closed five years earlier. Starting West Ham, the lines descend at the same rate as the climb, one in a hundred. Plastow retains much of its original London, Tilbury and Southend railway features. Upton Park opened in 1877. The District Railway was extended along this stretch of line from Whitechapel to Upminster in 1902, but following the electrification of the district three years later, the service was cut back to East Ham and the second pair of tracks laid for this objective. and you can see the old rusty steam age water tank. The old platforms of East Ham, like all the others, were taken out of use in 1962 after 104 years of service. As we have heard, East Ham was the end of the district's electrification in 1905. The four rails extended to Barking in 1908. Up and down lines now separate as we skirt around the back of the C2C depot here at East Ham, the main servicing facility for the Class 357 and 387 trains. The depot here opened in 1959, replacing the original London Underground one. Coming in sharply from the left is the very first rail line open through Barking, built as a joint venture between the Eastern Counties and London and Blackpool Railways back in 1854. The line continued onwards to Tilbury and Stanford La Hope, the course of which C2C trains take today. Flyover carries a double track line from that old railway and is used mainly by freight, but C2C trains can use this line to run into Liverpool Street via Stratford if Fenchurch Street is closed. The westbound district line now flies over the C2C lines to provide cross-platform interchange in both directions. Notice Bay Platform 3, used to turn back either the district or Hammersmith and City lines.
Barking Station was completely reconstructed in 1958 in order to segregate the district tracks from the main line. A major interchange station between the district and C2C lines Barking is also the terminus of the Hammersmith and City and London Overground services, the latter on the Gospel Oak to Barking line. Trains normally terminate in Bay Platform 1. The route was recently electrified in 2019 using the brand new Class 710 Aventra EMUs. Not too long in the distant future, the line will be extended over to Barking Riverside with completion estimated in either 2022 or 2023. Two main routes of C2C diverge here at Barking Tilbury Line Junction East, the route taken by the original LTSR line to Grays, Tilbury and Stanford La Hope. We shall travel over this route later and rejoin this line at Pitsea. In fact that line was seen as circuitous and this Barking to Pitsea direct line was constructed 31 years after the original via Tilbury. Opening in three stages, the first section from Barking to Upminster opened on May 1st, 1885. This is Upney. We continue to parallel the district line to Upminster, the second pair of tracks to our left coming into use in 1932, constructed by the LMS. British Rail had coincidentally owned the district tracks after nationalisation, but this eventually fell into LU ownership after 21 years. Incidentally, the voltage current on the four rail system is nominally rated at 750 volts DC. LTS in 1926 as Gale Street. This was changed to the current title in 1932. Dagenham Heathway was only opened with the electrified district railway back in 1932. It was just called Heathway until the prefix Dagenham was added in 1949. Dagenham East was one of two original stations to open between Barking and Upminster in 1885. As such, it had just been known as Dagenham. The East suffix was added at the same time as the Heathway name was changed in 1949. Dagenham East is the site of a fatal train crash that took place on the 30th of January 1958. Driving in foggy weather during the evening peak, the driver of the Fenchurch Street to Thorpe Bay service passed a signal at danger and ran into the back of another. As a result of the crash, 10 people paid with their lives and 93 seriously injured.
This is Elm Park, opened in 1935. Another one of the original 1885 stations was here at Hornchurch. It, along with Dagenham, lost their mainline traffic in 1962. Minster Bridge opened in 1934, the station taking its name from a nearby crossing over the River Inglebourne. On the approach to Upminster, the former Great Eastern Railway spur from Romford converges on our left. The line was built in 1893 as a two and a half mile spur, mainly for GER freight. There are seven working platforms here at Upminster, with three for C2C, three for the district line and one for the London Overground. The LMS completely rebuilt the station in 1932 with the arrival of the district line. The London Overground services from Romford via Emerson Park run every half hour and terminate on Platform 6. There is no direct connection between this line and the C2C tracks, the link being disconnected in 1968. The bay platform is not regularly used these days. The building to our right is the Upminster IECC, or Integrated Electronic Control Centre. The GER spur to Romford first opened from Grays in 1892, and it diverges to our right just here, nowadays used by services going to Shoebury Ness and South End Central. The district line tracks continue beyond the station to Upminster Depot, one of two main depots on the line, the other being at Ealing Common. The depot here opened in 1958, following the closure at East Ham. Upminster marks the eastern boundary of the City of London and the last of the houses give way to greenery. We are now on the second stage of the Barking to Pitsy Extension Railway. This stretch opened exactly one year later on the 1st of May 1886 to West Horndon. We pass under the M25, London's orbital motorway. 
The London, Tilbury and South End wanted to move away from Great Eastern Railway influences and it was discovered it needed to claim the area between the original line at Tilbury and the Great Eastern Main Line. The bill for the Barking to Pitsy extension was granted in 1882, also recognising with the opening of Tilbury docks, more goods trains would traverse the original route, rendering the two-track railway to become inadequate to passenger trains. Though the original route would still be used by passengers to stop at stations along the branch, the direct line was more focused on customers bounded for the South End conurbations. This is West Horndon, formerly called East Horndon when the LTS arrived here in 1886. The prefix East was changed to West in 1949, West Horndon actually being the larger of the two, the village having a population in the 2011 census of 1,537. East Horndon itself, located to the northeast, is little more than a hamlet these days, being a part of the civil parish of West Horndon and south of the borough of Brentwood. We are now on the last part of the direct line to open. The extension to Pitsy was opened on the 1st of June 1888. Beyond West Horndon, we are on an upward gradient, taking us to the line summit at Langdon. passes next to the Dunton Hill Family Golf Centre.
Braindon was once an ancient parish that included the chapelry of Basildon that became a civil parish in its own right in 1866. Today, Laindon is now a suburban district of Basildon Newtown, which also includes Pitsey and Vange. There are three platforms at Laindon. Platform 2 to our right is used to reverse certain trains in peak hours from London. The British actress Joan Sims, famous for her roles in the Carry On films, actually grew up in the station house. Her father was the station master. In her memory, a commemorative plaque was placed next to the station entrance. The section between Laindon and Basildon is only one mile apart. Out of the three stations which serve the new town, Basildon itself is by far the busiest, handling up to nearly 3.1 million passengers in 2019 and 2020. The station was opened by British Rail in 1974 and has been upgraded with facilities fit for the 21st century. Despite its catchy name, C2C doesn't really have any specific meaning, the name first appearing in 2000 when under the control of the National Express franchise. Such theories are that the C2C name is to represent city to coast, or capital to coast, or even commitment to customers. The line turns southeast in the direction of Pitsey. You will notice many signals facing us on the up line. Bidirectional working is employed between Barking and Shoebury Ness, which can be used during times of service disruption or engineering works.
The station is situated in a V with the original LTS line from Barking via Tilbury, the line having opened from Stanford La Hope to as far as Leon C in 1855. An unusual service was provided by the District Line, who operated a seasonal non-stop excursion service from Ealing Broadway. The service commenced in 1910, running to South End, extending to Shoebury Ness the following year. The District Service hauled an electric locomotive to as far as Barking, where an LTSR steam locomotive took over, running non-stop to Leon C, with a wide variation of stopping patterns in the central London area. The excursion trains were withdrawn in 1939. The station at Benfleet is located between Ferry Road and Station Road, with the main building located on the former. The station serves the town of South Benfleet as well as Canby Island. For the next three miles, the line is straight over Hadley Marsh.
In the background is Canby Island, covering an area of 7.12 square miles and home to a population of 38,000, separated by the mainland by a network of creeks. The island between 1911 and 1951 was one of the fastest growing seaside resorts in Britain. There are just the two connections to the island today by road, the B1014 which passes next to Benfleet Station and the Canby Way that connects with the A130. of Hadley Castle, which was built after 1215 during the reign of Henry III by Herbert de Burra. The castle was surrounded by parkland and had an important economic and defensive role, later expanded and remodelled by Edward III. Often the castle had been subjected to subsidence due to the fact it was built on a soft hill of London clay. Much of the former fortified castle remains today as a ruin grade one listed and preserved by English heritage. Sea, like Langdon, has three platforms, the centre road being used to turn back Fenchurch Street services in the peaks. The station we arrive at today was opened in 1934, replacing the original station of 1855 that was sited 880 yards to the east. Originally just called Lee, the appendage was fully adopted in 1904. Shubury Neck, calling out Chalkwell, Westcliff, South End Central, South End, Hot Bay, and Shubury Neck. built station was located here in Lee Old Town, the building of which still stands to our right, in use by the Lee Sailing Club.
The station at Chalkwell was only opened in 1933 with the inexorable spread of suburbia. The station is situated next to a beach on the Thames estuary and does not have any step-free access. We are now arriving at Westcliff, once called Westcliff on Sea when opened by the LTS in 1895. The suffix was dropped however in 1969. Many areas of Westcliff have been classified as conservation areas. One of these includes the Grade 2 listed building of Wesleyan Chapel, now the Park Road Methodist Church, which was built by Elijah Hall in 1872. The area takes its name from the cliffs formed by the erosion of the local quaternary geology that gives views over the Thames estuary towards the Kent coastline. Gradient is the steepest on this section of line, rising at 1 in 80. So we arrive at Southend Central Station with its four platforms, platforms 1 and 4 being bays and used regularly by the half hourly services from Fenchurch Street. The station is little changed since its opening from Leon Sea in 1856 and remained the easternmost terminus of the London Tilbury and Southend Railway until the extension to Shoebury Ness took place in 1884. The long platforms are testament to the number of excursion trains that used to arrive and depart here. Even today, during the peak hours, some of the C2C trains are extended from 4 to 8 and even 12 coaches. One of three stations that serve the town, Southend Central is just a short walk away from Southend Victoria, the terminus of Greater Anglia services from Liverpool Street. South End on Sea, to give the town its full title, is one of the most popular tourist seaside resorts in Britain, with hundreds of thousands of people visiting year on year. Famous for the seafront, the Adventure Island Amusement Park and the South End Carnival, the town is also famous for the Pleasure Pier, 
and has that title of being the longest built pleasure pier in the world, stretching for 1.34 miles or 2.16 kilometers into the sea. Dating from 1830, the pier has its very own railway system and started life as a horse-drawn tramway in 1851, though this was converted to electric in 1890 and finally to diesel in 1986. Another railway to beset the town is the Southend Cliff Railway. The funicular was constructed in 1912, but was closed due to technical problems in 2003. Following restoration work on the line, which totaled up to a cost of £3 million, the funicular was reopened for business on the 25th of May 2010. The town's population today is 183,000. Compare that to before in 1851, when the town's population was just 20,000. In 1912, the Midland Railway bought out the LTSR. One of its biggest challenges, though, was the rising traffic bound for South End. Trains would operate out of St Pancras, heading for both South End and Tilbury the latter in conjunction with boat trains. The company continued to control the LTSR lines until railway grouping in 1923, when it passed into the hands of the London, Midland and Scottish Railway. British Railways was formed in 1948, and the line passed into the London, Midland region. The only section that didn't was the route from Fenchurch Street to Gas Factory Junction, which fell under the Eastern region's umbrella. As of 2021, most of the network is largely intact, the only major line closure being the route into Tilbury Riverside and the associated branches. To our right at Southend East Station, you can see the remains of the former Southend Area Parcel Concentration Depot, now highly overgrown, the depot was in use from 1969 to 1981. The station here at Southend East was opened on the LTS in 1932, mainly to serve the area of South Church. However, excursion trains from London did stop here on a very limited basis. The extension to Shoebury Ness opened on the 1st of February 1884. The War Office had established a large military base at Pigs Bay, and the LTS hoped they would see the benefit of a direct rail line from South End. At first, the War Office opposed the idea, but they later changed their minds, and after one failed act, a second one was presented in 1882. Originally, there were no stations between South End and Shoebury Ness. But with rapid expansion of the housing market during the 1910s and 1930s, two new stations were provided.
The penultimate station on our journey from Fenchurch Street is Thorpe Bay, opening on the 1st of July 1910 as South Church on Sea, but this was changed to the present name 17 days later. The area was just called Thorpe, but became Thorpe Bay with the opening of the station, indicating that the area was a seaside settlement. Approach to Shoebury Ness, we can see the extensive carriage sidings with its 31 roads, used to store rolling stock during the day and overnight. In between the carriage sidings, a short unelectrified line leads to the site of MOD Shoebury Ness at Pigs Bay, which these days is used to store redundant rolling stock. The railway was private and had an extensive network, totalling up to some six miles. The military installation was established in 1849 and is still in use as a firing range today. And so we arrive at Shoebury Ness, the end of the line from London, little changed since its opening in 1884. The station building still survives and has a staff presence all day long. The old-fashioned level crossing, just a short stroll away from the station, is where the aforementioned rails lead to Pigs Bay. <laughs> 